join us as they will. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Wilson. I'm the director of HANDIS CSTPV, the Centre for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at the School of International Relations in the University of St Andrews. And it's the um, great privilege and pleasure of my position to preside over sessions like this one, um, which I've done nothing to organise and uh, whose research uh, is uh, lies a little adjacent to my own, but from which I can take the glorious chair. So I'm very grateful to uh, colleagues, um, particularly Sarah Barston and Ben Lee, for putting this on and for assembling such a deep bench of international talent to look really at, um, I think, is what is a genuinely fascinating and counterintuitive uh, area of study that seems to be emergent. This seems to me to stem from the brilliant observation that groups ostensibly dedicated to violent change, terrorist groups, extremist movements, groups for whom one might think violence was an absolute core part of their identity, actually spend a lot of their time not doing violence, and not just because no one can do violence all the time, but actually quite a lot of energy and time spent avoiding doing violence quite actively. So this session is, I think, uh, a sort of reflects a determination to peer into the black box of group decision making uh, inside those kind of terrorist groups or extremist movements to uh, investigate what does seem a rather counterintuitive puzzle about um, when and why they don't commit violence. And what are the forces behind that? What are the limits? Uh, what does limit the potential for violence in extremist settings? That, a sense, is the exam question that has been set to our experts tonight. Uh, what we will do is have three presentations of about 15 minutes each. Um, I'll introduce all those in a second. Then we'll open it out to a sort of round table between uh, the invited experts and then hopefully finish off with a, a few minutes of question and answers from uh, yourselves in the audience. Let me just stress in the sort of interest of mercy, uh, we're not going to record the question and answer session. Anyone can misspeak, it can make it pressured and we're keen to uh, have as wide ranging and free flowing a discussion and debate as possible. That's really the point of tonight's session. So please do uh, rest assured that that bit of proceedings will not be um, recorded and hopefully we'll sort of uh, finish up in about sort of 90 minutes time. So the presentations uh, on the theme of constraining violence will be led off um, by Joel Busher, Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. Um, there's much I could say about Joel's career. Uh, I will really just limit it to a couple of highlights. He's done us all the enormous service of writing this wonderful book, uh, The Making of Anti-Muslim Protest which I can best describe as his hanging out with the English Defence League so the rest of us don't have to. Um, it is really a truly wonderful study uh, that deservedly won the Phillips Abrahams Memorial Prize awarded by the British Sociological Association. And I, if you haven't read it, uh, go away and read it after this session. He has followed that up with um, some really heavyweight uh, contributions on what he calls the internal breaks on violent escalation written with distinguished colleagues such as Graham Macklin at, uh, at C-Rex and Donald Holbrook, formerly of CSDV. So uh, he will lead off with the first um, presentation and then the, the second presentation we shift um, to Leiden for, to uh, Bart Schurman. Bart is Associate Professor at Leiden's University's Institute for Security and Global Affairs. He has um, written with distinction across a wide range of topics. I owe him an enormous debt of gratitude because I foolishly volunteered to write the overview chapter for our forthcoming textbook on contemporary terrorism studies, in which I freely plundered Ben's, uh, Bart's apologies, uh, Bart's um, wide ranging synoptic surveys of the field, which were you know, really quite um, indispensable, that you know, strongly recommend to you. Uh, Bart's Critical Studies on Terrorism Peace from 2017, was it? I think a couple of years back. Uh, topics in Terrorism Research, Reviewing Trends and Gaps and some other uh, allied pieces. His work um, it is in many ways also distinguished by, by what I think of as the relentless pursuit of elusive questions. Some of us take the easy route out and uh, take pr take pleasure in setting exam questions for other people to answer, but Bart actually follows them himself. Um, and I you know, strongly recommend the recent piece, December 2020, in Perspectives in Terrorism, Non-Involvement in Terrorist Violence. You might think non-involvement in terrorist violence was a fairly um, endless subject in that most of us aren't involved in terrorist violence most of the time. But of course, in Bart's um, forensic uh, analysis, it's a much more tightly focused and revealing piece than that. 
Bart will be uh, assisted by Sarah Carthy, who um, has just produced um, a wonderful piece in uh, terrorism and political violence on the potential for counter narratives uh, in, uh, in, in the general cause of, of prevention. Um, she came up through a PhD in psychology at National University of Ireland in Galway um, and has also uh, written with distinction um, a Campbell systematic review for those in the field. Um, it's a sort of uh, catchphrase spoken of with awe. Um, they are pretty brutal exercises in trying to um, hoover up. Uh, the, the the state of a field across a fast um, fast changing picture, and she's done a, a wonderful job um, on uh, on this specific area of counter narrative interventions. Okay, so after Bart and Sarah, we will um, finish with a sort of CSDPV finale of uh, Sarah Marsden and Ben Lee. Sarah is senior lecturer at CSDPV. She joined us last year. Or, um, it is now last year, isn't it? Yeah, it's still a. Uh, it's only, only a year and a bit. It feels, feels like you've been back for a long time. Um, her research ranges very widely across a broad range of radical and violent uh, political groups, transnational social movements, violent militant networks, grassroots activists, um, really a very broad range of causes as well. Militant Islamists, anti-fascists, radical environmentalists, far right religious um, radicals and so on. A slew of heavyweight articles in terrorism and political violence, studies and conflicts and terrorism, Journal of Strategic Studies has also been uh, complemented by the wonderful reintegrating extremists that came out with Paul Grave in 2017, which is a, a brilliant and concise um, tour of a, of, a, of a landscape, the research landscape that at that stage was still fairly um, still fairly unformed in many ways and actually sort of manages to pick out the good stuff for the rest of us. Ben Lee also joined us at the same time. I have learned uh, much from him and his voracious appetite um, for following, if I say far right weirdos, apologies for that a term, Ben, but um, the more esoteric question, uh, corners of the um, transnational and networked um, extreme right. Uh, he uh, focuses on that area both in the UK and also transnationally. Uh, cut his teeth with a PhD at University of Manchester, and he's then had a distinguished research career through uh, the institutions of Leicester, Northampton, Lancaster, and now St Andrews. And he's the editor with Mark Littler of Digital Extremisms that came out just uh, in the middle of the pandemic Paul, with Paul Grave uh, last year. So that is our very distinguished panel. Um, as I say, we'll take the three presentations, I think, in turn. I will um, then uh, sort of try and facilitate a bit of a round table discussion between them because I think they have been carefully chosen and there will be natural areas of synergy, perhaps also divergence, uh, and then we'll open up to the Q&A. So without further ado, Joel, I'll hand over to you. Many thanks, Tim. Let me just share my screen and thank you, Sarah, for organising. Can you see that okay? Can you see that? Tim? Yeah, that works fine. Yeah. Took a moment to come up, but it's up now. Perfect. Okay, so thank you again. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this this roundtable discussion. Um, as Tim's already introduced, there seems to be this sort of basic but often rather overlooked question about why people in what we might call extremist groups, in groups that show some propensity for violence, um, don't actually carry out more violence, particularly when they appear to have the ability and the opportunity to do so. Um, I became interested in this really when I was doing my research with um, the English Defence League uh, back in sort of 2010 through 2012. And I started getting interested in this because you know, I was attending lots of demonstrations, events, public meetings, private gatherings um, of this movement that I was you know, kept hearing about how it was building support because it gave people opportunities for violence. But actually when I was attending events and demonstrations, very often there would be quite clear opportunities for violence um, that they didn't seem to take up. You know, there, there'd be confrontation and um, lots of name calling and shouting and posturing, but actual physical violence was, was actually relatively rare, um, both during sort of public demonstrations, but also during some of their clandestine activities. The image that I've shown you is the sort of image that you would normally um, sort of quite often associate with, with groups like the English Defence League. So this is 18th of June 2011. I'm actually just off camera um, over the shoulder of the gentleman in the, in the black jacket with a um, cigarette sticking out of his mouth. And this was in um, in Dagenham um, in, in East London. 
and it, there was an assault on um, two Muslim men who happened to cross the path um, of the of the demonstration. And you know, from this, it looks as though there's just a big pile on of English Defence League activists onto these two onto these two men. But actually, the interesting thing of this for me was that this was an event where the, the three, four people at the front did indeed sort of engage in this violence, but the people behind them in high-vis vests were very quickly trying to pull them off. Um, and there was sort of outrage and anger within um, the activist community that these people had, had carried out this assault because it had become a real badge of honour of theirs. They'd sort of been negotiating and trying to convince local um, public authorities that they could uh, steward, effectively sort of police their own their own demonstrations. They'd sort of done this quite effectively over a series of demonstrations. And this was a source of, sort of disappointment and actually shame for quite a few of the people. And some of the people involved in the movement um, actually then left shortly afterwards, in part as a result of um, this event. So I guess, you know, th this, th this, this idea about, OK, what's going on here, you know, this, this there, there, there are some people who engage in violence, but also uh, there's often attempts to kind of manage, control that violence. Uh, and sometimes violence was actually you know, part of what attracted people to this movement, but also sometimes something that pulled the movement apart. So that sort of set me off having an interest in this area. And then, as Tim said, over the sort of following years, I've then worked um, on a couple of projects that have sort of followed this, this interest through. It's part yeah, of the question. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Is it possible to change the slides to presentation mode? It was just a message came up. Sorry to stop you in your tracks. You want to show? Just to fill the screen. I think it's. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sorry for. No, no, no problem at all. Um, so the the first of these projects was with um, Donald Holbrook and Graham Macklin, funded by Crest, um, was a project that, as Tim said, called the Internal Breaks on Violent Escalation. And what we were interested in there was um, looking across different milieus, so looking at um, sort of international and UK-based jihadi milieus, looking at the animal liberation movement in the UK, and also looking at the British far right during the 19 um, during the 1990s, um, and trying to explore really how people within those milieus uh, established and maintained the parameters um, of, um, of of their violence, um, and also how they uh, sort of stimulated pivots away from from violence. So that's what we were interested in in looking at there. Um, that then led into um, a, a year ago um, a, a project, uh, an editorial project with Turi Burgo um, at C-Rex um, in perspectives of terrorism, where we delivered a special issue of perspectives of terrorism focused on restraining terrorist groups and radical milieus, um, to which Bart um, contributed, I should say. Um, and that brought together a, you know, a number of different um, uh, scholars to sort of explore this issue of how restraint emerges and, 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 and happens or, or fails within, within groups. Um, I also contributed to that an article with Rony Ellison, um, looking specifically at the dynamics of restraint within the Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty campaign. I suppose in the context of this um, discussion and, and with the, the title of the, the panel, I suppose one interesting point for me is that we've we, we talked very much in terms of restraint rather than constraint, um, because our our focus within this work, we were sort of particularly keen to bring into analytical focus, I suppose, the agency of people within these milieus and the deliberative processes through which restraint happened. And I think the thing we liked with the, the idea of restraint was that it, you have this sort of interesting ambivalence between you know, people can be put in restraint, so there's something potentially external, but also people exercise restraint, ideas of self-restraint. So you have this sort of interesting dynamic, I think, between the sort of external and, uh, and internal um, that, um, that we were keen to capture in, in that. And, and that actually, I think that all of the chapters, or all of the articles do um, very well. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to rattle a few, a, a few of the, the things that have, that have come out of um, that, that research. The first article and the report that um, that Graham and Donald and I wrote, we sort of started off by exploring within these different milieus and trying to identify um, what we call these these internal breaks on on violent escalation, so intra-group processes through which they established and maintained the the parameters on on their violence. And what became apparent to us was even looking across these sort of you know, groups using very different levels of violence, organising around very different sort of um, you know, ideologies drawn by different ideological wells, was that we could see breaks that were organising around a series of logics. And so we organised this typology around a series of logics. Um, 
So the first logic was being around strategic logic, essentially sort of concerns that violence might be counterproductive or might not be the most effective course of action. And a moral logic, um, so concerns that forms of violence might be immoral um, or, or, you know, that might, might be inappropriate. Um, and so those two, I suppose, were, were relatively obvious. Um, but then we also identified some other forms, um, some other logics that seem to um, underpin um, some some of these breaks. And, and some of those were about the way that groups identified themselves, so that their, their self-understanding. And um, so that they might identify themselves as a group that uses no violence or only limited forms of violence, um, and how that then affected the, the tactical choices that people made. Um, and then also, uh, the, the logic that we describe as outgroup definition. So their understanding of not only their opponents, um, but also sort of how they thought about the wider public. Um, so, you know, if they if they could soften those um, those boundaries by, for example, you know, not seeing their opponents, not casting their opponents as an existential threat, but simply sort of people who they're in a sort of competition with, but not necessarily an existential threat. Um, boundary softening with the general public um, could be sort of starting to identify parts of the public as potential supporters and therefore um, wanting not to alienate them. So this the sort of the outgroup definition logic often links into the sort of strategic and moral logics. Um, so that was another sort of logic we picked up on. And then there's something else and we call this organisational logic and I've sometimes wondered whether we should have called it bureaucratic logic instead. But it was this idea that actually there are, there are developments within organisations that make um, make violence more or less likely. So some of the things might be, for example, um, if they create a code of conduct, actually once there's a code of conduct, it then becomes more costly for activists to break that code of conduct, for example. So those are the sorts of things we're interested in, the sort of almost sort of path dependency that, that can take movements away from away, away from violence or inhibit their, their extra violence at times. I think one of the things that that did, um, apart from stimulating lots of um, conversation, discussion and, and sometimes criticism, um, which is what one would hope for. Um, it, it raised questions for us about sort of how these different breaks work and fail. And that's kind of the next piece that we went on, went on to look at. Um, and so in our next article, we, we sort of set out, a, I suppose, a, a few ideas about things that can help us to understand how they work and fail. One of these um, is we sort of set out this very basic idea about saying, okay, well, we need to situate these sort of intra-group processes of negotiating the action, action repertoire within a wider understanding about the conflict dynamics. So sort of how the how the shifting conflict dynamics, how you know, um, changing political opportunity structures, um, changing strategies of action by uh, societal elites or security forces actually affect that, the, the way that um, internal breaks operate within movements. So picking up that, but also thinking about the sort of the individual level and the role of things like sort of moral intuition, um, the emotional dynamics that take place you know, during demonstrations or during attacks and so forth, um, and sort of, yeah, sort of recognizing that actually, you know, ultimately it's it's individuals or you know people who are carrying out potentially carrying out acts of violence, and sort of trying to think how do we situate that within our sort of wider understanding of, of how internal breaks do and don't function. And then sort of trying to trace um, sort of between those, those levels. So that was that was one of the parts that we thought was was sort of interesting and relevant. Another was um, thinking about, I suppose, the different um, what we call like different levels of proximity to violence. And I think this was something where, again when we were looking at where we saw these breaks operating within these different milieus. You know, sometimes we see it at the sort of very high level theoretical discussions taking place within movements, you know, what type of violence is or isn't acceptable or should or shouldn't be pursued. But those conversations are sort of function slightly differently to what we might see once people are actually in the process of planning actions, where if you like the sort of the reality of those actions, the, the practicalities of, of those potential actions start to come more to bear on, 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 on um, whether or not those breaks are or aren't being applied. And then you have the sort of situational context, you know, what's actually happening within um, within the attack or within the protest and so forth. And in a way, um, doing this you know, was, was sort of influenced quite a lot by some of the work on sort of processual approaches to the dynamics of political violence. So people like Stefan Malthanger and, um, and some of their work there. And I guess one of the things that we were particularly interested in here was what we call the immediate post-escalation context. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the EDL. Um, you know, there's this, we saw a very sort of a, a concentration 
if you like, of the application of breaks, often coming immediately after instances of escalation. Um, and there's a sort of interesting question there about how we interpret the application of breaks in those contexts. You know, is, is it simply people trying to cover their own backs you know, legally and so on and so forth? Or is it that we're seeing groups trying to re-establish the parameters on, on their violence and sort of trying to turn those instances of escalation into outliers rather than a new normal? So there seems to be something quite interesting there. And, and what we liked about this was that it starts to help us to understand this breaking as a, as a fairly dynamic process. The other thing that we picked up on in in in, in that, in that um, article was this idea that there are sort of different types of mechanisms through which these intergroup breaks seem to generate or enable restraint. Um, and we sort of summarise these as, as follows. So there's there's one which is sort of disciplinary, so rules, sanctions, rewards, you know, codes of conduct, people getting in trouble if they break those cons of codes of conduct and so forth. Um, and we could identify those within each of the each of the, the case studies that we'd looked at. Um, then there's one which is sort of how people often senior people within the movement sort of shape the other group members perceptions of, of their struggle you know so if they sort of shape it in a way that says we're taking along a large part of the population with us therefore we mustn't alienate them and therefore um you know actually we need to uh, you know conduct we, we need to act with restraint you know we need to get people on side and, and perhaps in a more exaggerated forms of violence will lose that support. So that's sort of shaping members' perceptions of the struggle. And then another one is about shaping group or individual capabilities. Um, so again, you know, if you start investing in capabilities to go out and elect um, and campaign around elections, um, actually you start to make focusing on elections more more attractive and, and sort of street street protesting becomes starts to become less attractive. So there are ways in which they organize that starts to 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 to, to um, yeah, it starts to affect perhaps the, the, the type of strategies that they use. But then the fourth one also seemed to be interesting to us, and one of them, and this is around sort of what we call generating opportunities to, to favour less violent strategies of action, um, but without losing face. And this we saw sort of quite interesting when, for example, you know, if movements can create a narrative for themselves about their discipline, for example, or you know, playing the long game, um, it makes it easier then for activists within those milieus to say, no, I'm not going to engage in violence here because you know I've got a reason a reason for doing it which isn't cowardice if you like um so it kind of there's sort of interesting sort of discursive ways in which it, it's they can start to make it easier for their own activists not to be drawn into in, into violent confrontation um I suppose following on from that picking up on similar themes in some ways my work with uh, Rune Ellison on the dynamics of restraint in the stop in the in the shack campaign um, you know, we focus very much on this idea of the, the two different types of restraint. So we looked across the Shack campaign um, and within that we saw, you know, there, there are early on in the campaign, we see quite a bit of innovation away from more violent forms of action, which is interesting. And then later in the campaign, we see a slightly different type of restraint, which is around maintaining the outer limits of, of the action repertoire. And what was interesting when we looked more closely at these was that actually they, they worked in slightly different ways, these two different types of restraint. Um, in this particular case study, and I guess one of the questions then for us is, is that is that the same in other cases? What was noticeable for us was that when we were talking about the innovation away from violence, um, that was partly associated with, um, you know, the basic strategy of action, but it was also associated with the operating environment in which they were working. And so in, in their the political opportunity structures that were opening up. Um, uh, so, so there was this sort of, it was, it was some, somehow the innovation away from violence was actually quite contingent on the actions of external parties. On the other hand, when we were looking at the maintaining of the outer limits in the action repertoire, rep repertoire um, it seemed to be grounded very much, sort of very deeply inscribed within the, the, the basic the sort of strategic and moral logics of, of the campaign and the wider movement. So being less contingent, if you like. Um, and we thought this, this is interesting because Certainly one of the things, there seems to be something interesting about sort of thresholds of, of escalation and, um, and this sort of idea that you know, within this campaign we saw the breaks that were associated with the innovation away from violence start to fail um, because the, the, the situation changed and actually those the things that were kind of enabling activists to move away from more violent strategies of action weren't there anymore and, and so we started to see this escalation but those breaks could start to fail but the breaks around the sort of overall outer limits of the action repertoire remained in place. 
And so there seems to be something potentially interesting there in terms of thinking about um, risks and how risks evolve over time. So some final reflections, I'm, I'm aware of time and so forth. So I think one of the things you know, for me is looking at restraints that have done over these, these projects is restraint rather like if we're thinking about um, radicalization or have people become involved in, in violence, multi-causal, dynamic, contingent process, so complex process, as put here, um, you know, strategic adaptation, emergent social structures, it's about individuals as well. So, it, so it's, it's, it's a sort of complex process uh, and that brings with it quite a few different analytical challenges. Um, perhaps and I'll go into those more in, in, in due course. Um, but some of those is about you know, the visibility of breaks, what do we do about timescales? Uh, so some of Jakob Ravendahl's work about sort of thinking about you know, threats now versus threats down the line um, is, is really relevant there. And actually, when we're trying to make assessments of breaks and whether or not they work, how do we assess whether violence is or isn't escalating? It is sometimes quite challenging. Um, so there's a number of analytical challenges, but but I still come away from it thinking that there's potential there for enhancing our understanding of, of threats um, and in a number of ways. So you know, one is particularly around giving us a more balanced understanding of, of, of threats, you know, understanding where, where restraint is being applied and, and sort of not always assuming that we're just going to see violence sort of spiral and spiral because it often doesn't. Um, one, I think, is around the identification of intervention opportunities um, and seeing how there are opportunities for actually working with internal breaks that we can identify within these milieus. Um, and I think the other is in terms of understanding what's actually holding violence back, what's limiting violence, um, and then understanding how that might change, either as a result of external factors or indeed sometimes because of interventions from uh, state actors and, and other people who perhaps engaging with good intention, but, but, but might actually disrupt some of these internal breaks um, unintentionally. So I'll leave it with that uh, and hand over to the next speaker. Thanks very much, Joel. Um, you've set hairs running in all directions for us to chase, but we'll resist the temptation just for a moment. If uh, if Bart and Sarah could um, take up the reins, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Yeah, uh, you should see that there. Um, Thank you so much, Sarah and Ben and Joel as well. Very interesting presentation. And um, there's certainly certainly a lot of overlap in um, what we're doing and what you're doing. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, as Tim said, my name is Sarah Carthy. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Leiden University's Institute of Security and Global Affairs. And I'm here with Bart Grumman, who is the project lead. And together we're going to take you through this project, which isn't at its end, we're only about halfway through, um, but we do have quite a bit to talk about, I think. Um, I'm going to take you through the concept of the project, talk a little bit about the methodological approach, and then Bart will take over, go over some preliminary findings, what they might mean, and a few take home messages um, at the end. So I suppose we'll get into it. Just to start off as well, our funders are the Dutch Research Council, um, the NWO, and also the Canadian government's Community Resilience Fund. Um, the Canadian side is funding the American portion of the project, and the Dutch side is funding the European leg. Um, I suppose this idea is not um, new to this audience and it's already been highlighted by Tim that for those who come to perpetrate terrorist violence, the vast majority will do so by first undergoing a process of radicalization into terrorism. That's something that has very much dominated counterterrorism discourse for the last number of years. But with this idea, this process outcome idea, there, there is a caveat, and that caveat is that for those who radicalize, the vast majority will actually never come to become involved in planning, perpetrating or commissioning terrorist violence. And this subgroup is a subgroup of which we actually know very little, those who radicalize and don't go on to become involved in terrorism. Now, this is a problem for a number of reasons. Ultimately, what this knowledge offers 
or the, the question it addresses. To be honest, it's a question which guides almost every study of undesirable human behaviour. And that question is what sets certain people apart? Without this knowledge, we find ourselves faced with a situation in which we can explain why certain people reach this sharp end of a trajectory, but we don't even have an exploratory understanding of why the vast majority of people don't. Um, and that's what we refer to as a specificity problem. When we look at radicalization models and theories, even though it's a novel area, we still find that the data used to inform our understanding People who commit terrorist violence are overrepresented in those data sets. And that means that if we've identified, for example, risk factors that are supposed to predict assignment to a terrorist violence category, if those risk factors also predict assignment to the category that doesn't become involved in terrorist violence, it's not a risk factor for assignment to one group over the other. This overemphasis on the dependent variable, which is involvement in terrorist violence, it means that we're kind of masking discrepancies in a really complex population and, and obscuring the potential to see protective factors, which are probably present in radicalized individuals who don't go on to commit terrorist violence, but we don't have data on those people, so it's hard to identify them. Um, risk factors alone are not enough to understand the problem, and these protective factors can tell us a little bit more about how to maybe stop people getting to this, this part of the trajectory. Now, in many ways, this question, what sets certain people apart, it's a nice question to have, because in our line of work, terrorism, radicalization, very novel area, very exciting, but it also means we don't have our own methodologies to answer our questions, ones, ones that are stringent enough to ask, answer these sorts of questions. So we tend to borrow from other disciplines, right? Like psychology, like criminology, even from the health sciences. And the question, what sets certain people apart? It's asked in so many disciplines. If we have a group of individuals who all smoke, but only some of them go on to develop lung cancer, that's a question that has been asked, you know, years and years ago, and the designs that are used to answer these questions are actually quite rigorous. So the design that we went with is called a similar systems, different outcome design. So ultimately, we select individuals based on what we call their outcome status. And as you might have guessed, there's one of two outcomes we're interested in, those who become involved in terrorist violence and those who don't. So what we're looking to do is to try and get an idea of how different variables function across a person's trajectory between these two groups based on uh, based on processes of radicalization. So we're tracking a person's trajectory uh, to the outcome of interest. Um, now, in line with the British Medical Journal guidelines for conducting these types of studies, there's a few things we have to be mindful of because ultimately this is an exploratory design. We're not collecting the type of data that can identify causality really between variables. We're not necessarily testing any theories, but we're trying to find the dots that can be uh, connected later on. But even though it's exploratory, there's certain things we do need to be mindful of. And I'll talk about these in turn. So the first is our sampling method. So who actually counts that can come into our data set based on the, the outcome status? The ascertainment of exposure, so the variables we actually look at. Um, and then finally, bias, right? So we're two different researchers, we come from two different disciplines and we're coding many, many cases and hoping that uh, we are being consistent in how we code different variables and understand different phenomena. So the potential for bias is quite high, so it's something we have to check semi-regularly. So in terms of the methodological approach and the sampling, the first thing we're doing is being very strict in the population that we define. So involvement in terrorist violence doesn't necessarily mean that the person has undergone a radicalization trajectory beforehand. Not everyone who's a terrorist has been radicalized. Some might do it for financial reasons, for example. We're only interested in individuals that have undergone a process of radicalization. So that means that all our people are matched from the same pool. Um, 
And that pool is individuals that radicalised in North America or Europe. We're including individuals connected to right-wing extremism and also Salafi jihadist extremism. They have to be homegrown. So we don't necessarily want individuals who radicalised somewhere else and then came to North America or Europe. We want their socialisation to have unfolded in, in the country of interest. And we've narrowed it to the post-1980s era just so we can narrow as many extraneous variables as possible and hope that the variables we're looking at will explain the change, the differences between the groups rather than something that, that isn't really captured in our code book that could be explained by, um, by including cases from earlier dates or so on. Um, and then we have to be considerate of how we're defining the cases and controls as well. So like I said, we're selecting individuals based on an outcome status involved in terrorist violence or not. But every single person in our population has to have the potential to become involved in terrorist violence. What do I mean by that? We had a case that we sadly had to exclude an individual who we had classified as not involved in terrorist violence. He spent his entire radicalization trajectory in prison. Obviously, he wasn't involved in terrorist violence. He probably never would have, but he physically couldn't have become involved in terrorist violence because he was in prison. So that means he can't be, he didn't have the potential to become in a part of one group over the other, and therefore we had to exclude him. So the potential of the non-violent people to become violent has to be equivalent. Um, now, having said that, not just with our study, but even with the lung cancer studies or any of them, they always say that these requirements are often impossible to satisfy in most case control studies. Um, but one way of making sure that the cases and controls are equivalent is this process of individual matching. So what we do is for every involved in terrorist violence case, we have a non-violent counterpart and so on. And it means that the regions are equally represented. It means that we don't have too many Salafi jihadists and not enough uh, right wing, that we have enough violent and not enough non-violent and so on. And then the ascertainment of exposure. What we're talking about here is uh, the variables that we're looking at. So a code, Bart created a code book of almost 160 items. And we apply this code book to primary and secondary data that we collect on the individuals we've selected. Now, these variables vary. We have many structural level variables that would latch on to, I think, a lot of what Joel was speaking about. Is there a conflict ongoing that influenced the desire to adopt an extremist ideology? Um, things that are happening in the environment, political representation, that sort of thing. We're also cognizant of group level variables. So did the individual become involved in an extremist group? How old was the group when they joined? How many members? Was there military members? That kind of thing. And then we have a lot of individual level variables as well. Some of these are very easy to toss up. How many siblings did the person have? Gender, that kind of thing. Some of them are tricky, like trying to gauge a person's level of self-control, trying to gauge uh, the extent to which they identified with victims of injustice. Um, and in many ways, this has been helped by the access we've gotten to these individuals' internal worlds, both through primary sources, like speaking to them. We've managed to speak to a lot of individuals, autobiographies as well, and also detailed uh, court evaluations and psych reports, which would go through these sorts of things in more detail. Um, so yeah, personal recall and expert documents for primary sources and then secondary sources such as autobiographies and um, newspaper articles where, where, where we have to kind of rely on that sort of thing. Um, but throughout it all, what we're cognizant of is this idea of bias and the reliability of the code book. So over time, we're constantly coding cases separately, coming back together and making sure that we're coding things consistently based on Cohen's Kappa. Because the code book is iterative, I suppose. And what we want to be careful of is that we're not coding things and then diverging somewhere in between because we've been coding for a year. And um, so we want to make sure that it's somewhat standardized. Um, that's the methodological approach. I don't think it's as interesting as the preliminary findings. So I'll hand it over to Bart now to take you through that and looking forward to, to the discussion later. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Let me see if I can get this working. Sure. Uh, it should be visible for all of you now. 
Although, Sarah, you may have to stop uh, sharing first. Yeah. I think I've stopped, have I? Uh, it's visible for me, Bart. Okay, great. So if you can uh, see what I'm uh, trying to present here. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction of our project. Very, very thorough. Um, with the time remaining, and, and Tim, please let me know if I, if I you know, go over, but I'll try not to. I just wanted to share with you a couple of preliminary results. So just mindful of the fact that our project is still ongoing, we are nearing the finalization of data collection. So we have some 200 plus cases in total. Um, I'm only talking about the European ones right now, which is around 116 cases, because those are the ones that we have actually done some preliminary, um, let's say, data analysis on. So what I'm about to say, you know, in the final results, in the final papers we hope to produce, it, it might be different, but I've chosen those kind of differences between the involved in terrorist violence and non-involved in terrorist violence uh, subgroups that I think are quite robust. So I expect these differences will hold true um, when we have finished all of our data collection and analysis. So what I'd like to just highlight here are a couple of things that stand out in terms of the differences between extremists who do not use terrorist violence and those who do. So first of all, we're seeing something um, that uh, those who kind of restrain from going to this, you know, uh, crossing this final threshold is that they are slightly more likely to feel politically represented, that there are parties perhaps not in power, but that you can vote for that to some degree represent the views that they hold uh, very dear. They're also much less likely to perceive the state as an active enemy. Like they're usually very negative of the state and the system in which they live overall. But these non-involved in terrorist violence individuals and group will usually not see the state as out to destroy their uh, themselves, the people they hold dear, and the ideas who, that they they stand for. Which is a big difference from those who do become involved in terrorist violence. There is a very active sense of the state being an, uh, an aggressor. The non-terrorist uh, ones are also more likely to participate in bigger and older groups. And I think this kind of speaks to the fact that if you have an extremist group, if you are a neo-Nazi, for instance, or far right, or if you're a Salafi jihadist, you're only going to be able to survive for any amount of time in, in um, a democracy such as those in Europe and North America if you, by and large, play within the uh, legal order, right? So. If a group is able to survive for a period of time, it's probably become socialized to some extent to playing by those ground rules. We're also seeing something that I think really uh, speaks to the, uh, the, the, the first presentation that the Joel was just giving about the moral and strategic logics. So the people who restrain and the groups who restrain from using terrorist violence, they'll usually say something like, you know, uh, violence is legitimate, it's justifiable, but just not right now. And so there is a strategic logic that sees violence as something that is more useful or more beneficial to, to turn to at some point in the often undefined future. So it's, it's okay to use, but just right now. Or it might be morally qualified, right? There might be some concerns about when, or sorry, against who this violence should be used or in what form that you don't really see in the outspokenly violent groups and individuals, right? There's very little discussion about whether there should be any boundaries on who can be targeted and what kind of means should be used. We also see some rather more straightforward ties to society as keeping people and groups from crossing this final threshold. So the, the non-involved in terrorist violence subcategory, they're more likely to have involvement, uh, sorry, more likely to have employment at the time that their radicalization trajectories start, but they're also much more likely to maintain some form of employment, right? So keeping them uh, tied to society. And the same goes for education, the same goes for family responsibilities. And we're seeing some interesting individual level stuff here as well. Uh, although it's difficult to, to gauge very precisely, we do see that the non-involved in terrorist violence individuals uh, seem to have a higher degree of self-control. They have a lower degree of ideological commitment. And this latter one might be particularly interesting uh, because how do we gauge this? So we try to assess, for instance, are people willing to give up important relationships such as with family, friends, significant others? Are they willing to give up important responsibilities such as those towards family or those towards employment or study to really focus all uh, their effort and time on their ideological convictions? And this is much less likely 
in those individuals who uh, don't become involved in terrorist violence. There's something about where people grow up as well that seems to be relevant. So uh, there's a strikingly higher representation of people from a middle class background um, in the non-violent subgroup. The, then there's also something about their social networks. Uh, the people who you know, don't cross to terrorism are much more likely to have and maintain over time at least some degree of viewpoint diversity. And so they might, for instance, not cut ties with family or not cut ties with old friends. So there is still some counterweight to the very extremist and radicalized points of view that they are um, kind of uh, adopting and that they are increasingly becoming involved in through their new extremist social networks and their new friends. So there's still some counterweight there. We also see that this group is more likely to fear or to have some concerns about what would happen to them personally if they were to go uh, towards fully uh, illegal and violent means. And so they might be concerned quite logically about losing their life or ending up in prison for a very long time. There might be concerns about what this might do to their careers or how it might hurt their um, uh, family responsibilities, things like that. And finally, uh, well, as a final thing I'd like to share today, that is, the non-involved in terrorist violence subcategory appears to be much more likely to have some form of non-violent activism. And so they have an, an, an outlet, a way of giving voice to their convictions that while it's still extremist, so they might still be advocating for a all-white ethnostate or for the um, imposition of a, of a caliphate, they're doing that in a way that is essentially uh, democratic. That's essentially playing by the rules of liberal democracies. And I think, again, this kind of speaks to this notion of them being socialized by the rules of the game and this imposing some boundaries that are then very difficult to cross. Uh, once you've committed yourself to, for instance, um, vying for local power through elections, it's quite hard to then turn to uh, terrorist violence. So just to round off, um, some these were some preliminary results. Um, and if I were to, well, if we were to kind of summarize the differences, I'd say that we see the non-involved in terrorist violence subgroup as being perhaps more driven for a search for belonging and identity. So the, so the group itself as a vehicle for those things becomes much more important, whereas those who become involved in actual terrorist violence see their ideology and see their compatriots much more as vehicles for revolutionary change. So it's much more instrumental for the latter category. And just as a final thought, uh, I've talked about some differences here. What we're also seeing is that there are a lot of similarities between these groups. And in particular, for instance, the prevalence of broken families uh, and of having a, a pretty rough upbringing. So we're also hoping to explore, you know, what might, uh, what might be some shared characteristics of these groups. In any case, that was it for now. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we were looking to starting up our, our publication cycle, so to speak, next year. So hopefully by then we'll have uh, fuller results to relate to you. Thank you for now. Thanks very much, Bart. Thanks, Sarah. Um, you know, both of you gave us a wonderfully clear tour of a landscape, despite being doubtless snow blind with data processing. Most impressive. Um, I'll now just hand over then to the home team to um, ask Sarah, so to speak, and Ben, if I may. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks, uh, Joel, Bart and Sarah for really fascinating um, discussion and presentations. And I'm looking forward to the discussion actually to see how they they pull together. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about research that Ben and I are um, sort of a year into at this stage. And in our remarks now, what I want to do is try and propose a way of thinking about what constrains violence by theorising how some of those protective factors that Bart and Sarah were talking about work at the micro level, but also trying to think about how subcultural constraints might operate at the meso level. So as I say, this is the first phase of a sort of a wider body of work that we're doing on protective factors and subcultural constraints, and it's really the conceptual foundation for the project. Um, so we want to develop that further over the next couple of years through more empirical research. Um, so these, these are, as I say, sort of preliminary framings. Um, I'm going to sort of set out how we're thinking about concept those processes and then I'm going to hand over to Ben who's going to provide some examples of how that might play out particularly looking at the context of the far right and the sort of overall argument that I want to suggest is that there are perhaps at least two ways in which extremist subcultures might constrain violence so the first is by providing ways for individuals to find meaning enjoyment fulfillment 
by creating opportunities for them to engage in what really are intrinsically rewarding practices that are enough to satisfy an individual's needs in ways which don't necessarily require people to engage in the violence that the subcultures are predicated on. So, for example, and to really oversimplify, uh, if someone's motivated, as, as Bart's just suggested, by a really strong need to belong, they may find that they're able to meet that need in a particular extremist subculture without the need to engage in violence. So that's the first way in which constraints might operate um, within sort of extremist subcultures. The second one is actually more to do with the norms and the structure of subcultural capital that develops in those spaces. Um, and the sort of hypothesis, I suppose, that we're exploring is that those forms of subcultural capital might prioritise particular forms of non-violent or legal action, which, although they might actually further the sort of ambition of the political project, they might actually delay or otherwise complicate the move towards violence. So again, really simple example. For example, they might emphasize values like patience or resilience and fortitude. So while saying violence is okay, we need to wait until the time's right to act. So what we're sort of exploring is whether the structure of opportunities and the norms that are at work within counter-normative subcultures might constrain the potential for violence by allowing people to fulfill particular needs at the micro level, but also creating an opportunity structure that prioritises non-violent, albeit non-normative practices at the meso level. And what we feel is useful about that, particularly at the moment, is to try and understand how these processes play out in contemporary extremist spaces, which have been characterised by John Moore Hall and others as post-organisational. So that's to say that they're more fractured, they're less reliant on kind of formal organisations and recognisable groups than perhaps they were in the past. Um, so the sort of subcultural framing, subcultural theory seems to give us a, a way of conceptualising those more contemporary violent extremist spaces, as well as understanding how kind of constraints might operate. So I'm going to sort of unpack that a little bit and, and describe some of the theory that sits behind that um, before, as I say, I sort of pass on to uh, Ben. So, of course, the question that we're concerned with trying to understand is, given the number of people who engage in really what can be very, very violent subcultures that um, people sort of find intrinsically attractive, why is it that only some move on to engage in violence or terrorism? And that's obviously the question that we're all concerned with. Um, and the literature's looked for different ways of interpreting those kind of constraints. So at the micro level, research has begun to explore protective factors, and it's great to hear more about some of those from Bart and Sarah. Um, so those protective factors, things which mitigate or buffer the effect of risk factors or perhaps sit alongside them. And then at the meso level, scholars like Joel uh, and the colleagues that Joel's been working with, as well as a, a previous project, actually, I was fortunate enough to work with here at the centre with uh, Gilbert Ramsey. Um, those sorts of research projects have tried to understand kind of organisational subcultural features that help explain the limits of violence more at a sort of a group level. And both of those, as you've heard, have not received a great deal of attention. And I think one of the reasons for that is obviously this sort of emphasis on trying to explain why violence unfolds, but also um, this sort of emphasis on the risk model that sits within research that looks at radicalisation processes. So this sort of preoccupation really with trying to identify risk factors, understand push and pull factors that operate within terrorist spaces, um, and through that try and sort of help explain why people engage in terrorism, but also more generally in the wider criminological space, trying to explain through risk factors why people break the law. Um, and of course, the emphasis has been there rather than explaining, trying to explain why they don't. But there are some real challenges to the risk model. Um, people have argued um, that it has too great an emphasis on individual deficits. So the sort of risks associated with the things that are perceived to be kind of wrong with the individual. And that neglects the sorts of protective factors that we're just starting to see more work pay attention to. Um, arguably, it also neglects agency and the sort of goal directed nature of human behaviour because it assumes in its crudest form and this is doing a disservice to what is a wide body of literature but it assumes really that people are influenced by kind of a confluence of risk factors rather than being more agentic or self-motivated and I think a broader point is that it, it doesn't pay sufficient attention really to the social ecological and contextual factors that shape those opportunities to engage in counter-normative behaviour um, and the way that they sort of shape norms, attitudes and reflect different sorts of patterns of risks and protections. An alternative that's been sort of unfolding over the last sort of 
um, 10 years or so is, is more of a strengths-based perspective, and that's what sort of informs some of the research that Ben and I are doing. So this focuses on strengths or the features of the individual, but also their environment that enables them to pursue meaningful, fulfilled lives or to desist from crime or terrorism once they've become engaged in it. And it's broadly informed by kind of positive psychology. It echoes Amartya Sen, Martha Nussbaum, their human capabilities approach. And it really tries to understand those kind of individual and contextual capacities, the uh, development of resilience, the strengths which help people navigate life in ways which sort of avoid them getting into trouble, but enable them to meet their personal goals. And one of the most sort of concrete manifestations of that strengths based approach is the good lives model, which is an approach that I've um, sort of been doing research on for quite a while. And this assumes and starts from a different position to the kind of risk based approach. It argues that we're all motivated to pursue a range of what the good lives approach would describe as 11 primary goods. So these are things like community or relatedness, excellence in work or spirituality or play. And it further argues that we try and achieve those goods, those primary goals through secondary goods. And these are practices, practical things that we do to help us attain things that matter to us. And the argument that this approach um, sort of presents in relation to engaging in non-normative or illegal behaviour is that where routes to achieving those goods are blocked or difficult, then non-normative or illegal routes become seen as an appropriate option. So if you're living in a certain context and you're really motivated by community, you might um, and join a group, uh, uh, whether it's a scout organisation or a flower arranging or whatever it might be. If you're in a different kind of context altogether and you want that community, then it might be the options are much more reduced and less normative. So it might be around joining a criminal gang, for example. Very, very simple examples, but ways of thinking about the obstacles that people encounter when they're trying to pursue things that matter to them. Now, of course, we've all got different conceptualizations of a good life. We've all got different goals that matter to us in different kinds of ways. And that's in, they're informed by the sorts of social context we're part of, the subcultures we engage in. And what that means is the extent to which something might be a risk or a strength is at least in part shaped by the subjective context somebody's in. So, for example, motivations um, that might be linked to terrorism, like a commitment to social justice, competencies about terrorism, uh, around terrorism offending, like empathy with a wider identity group suffering, then in their own terms, they're not problematic. It's the context that they're pursued in and the means by which people address them that can break social norms and legal norms. So sort of standing back from that slightly, what does that say? It means in the context of that kind of good lives approach, those violent or extremist subcultural context shape norms about which goods are important, they tell us what matters, but they also provide practical opportunities to pursue them. And they place different kinds of values on the range of concrete practices or secondary goods through which those goals might be achieved. So what that perhaps gives us is a theoretical way of interpreting how protective factors might work at the micro level, and a way of thinking about how constraints might operate at the meso level. So what we're sort of developing is this sort of conceptual interpretation of protective factors and constraints to identify three sites at which these factors might be at work and that they are um, arguing as well that they operate both within um, counter, to counter normative spaces, but also outside them. So most straightforwardly, constraints or protective factors might operate in the context of promotive factors. So these are things which might reduce the likelihood we engage in harmful behaviour. So that might re uh, these might be factors which reduce our exposure to violent extremist settings or they might limit the perceived need or the benefits for them. So for example, political context characterized by procedural justice or social cohesion, supportive social environments are less likely to motivate people to pursue radical political change. So that's the first space that they might be at work. The second one is within those counter normative settings. So if we apply the ideas from the good lives model, it's possible to see how engaging in those spaces might actually provide means of achieving primary goods which are actually blocked or difficult to access in someone's ordinary life. And it also suggests that people might be deploying strengths, not just motivated or pushed by risk factors, in order to achieve things that come to matter to them. And depending on the goals that motivate that engagement in that way, you can begin to see how somebody might actually maintain engagement in that space because they're achieving the things that come to matter to them without any need to engage in violence. 
And then the third space that these constraints might operate in, in relation to subcultural um, contexts, is through the sorts of values or subcultural capital that becomes associated with different kinds of practices. So what I mean by that is um, recognising that these spaces provide opportunities for people to do lots of different things. They can take on different kinds of roles that might involve leading ideological work, cultural production, making things, graphic design, it might involve community building. But it also might involve planning and organising for violence. And within those subcultures, there are different sorts of values associated with different kinds of practices. So as an example, um, a particular set of um, in a particular setting, you might see that certain forms of preparation that stop short of mobilisation for violence are prioritised. Um, you might see other settings where that are focused very heavily on sort of inward looking efforts to police a community's ideas and behaviours. And that might actually act as a constraint. Now, of course, the nature of those norms varies depending on the context, but it might be possible to think about those subcultural constraints that operate in ways that reduce the potential for violence because of the structure of subcultural capital that develops in extremist spaces. So there's some of the sort of ideas that we're exploring. I'm going to pass over to Ben, who's going to um, hopefully put some flesh on the bones of what might be a, a slightly kind of dry theoretical account to understand or at least sort of begin to set out how that might look in the context of the contemporary far right. So I'll hand over to Ben. OK, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, it's kind of constantly mentioned to me in our dynamic that you get to do all this kind of rather elegant theory and uh, then inevitably it becomes my job to drag us all straight back down to the gutter of real life. So apologies um, if this comes off as a, a slightly depressing presentation as, um, after kind of Sarah's discussion of the good lives model there. So yeah, basically what I've been asked to do is kind of provide some practical examples, I guess, of how you can interpret subcultures um, as being a constraint on extremist violence um, and really kind of interrogate this idea and see how it might play out in reality. I'm going to provide just two examples. I'm only talk for a couple of minutes um, based on a, a case study that we are kind of in the midst of undertaking on a, on a subculture we're calling siege culture. Some of you may have heard it, heard of it before. It, it, it's basically the most or one of the more extreme interpretations of the extreme right. So groups like Atomwaffen or kind of latter day bits of national action would certainly fit firmly within this space. And I'm going to provide kind of two examples of how we, we think we might have seen constraints in operation in this space. There's going to be one which is kind of relatively backwards looking and, and quite almost approaching the historical now, and one that's quite contemporary. And I think the main kind of point to take away from both of these examples is there's I mean, someone, there are plenty of ways to get involved in these spaces. There are plenty of things to do in these spaces that are not violent. They offer far more than an automatic trajectory towards violence, which in essence, I, I, I guess, is kind of what all this theory is, is helping us to work out. So the first example is a book um, which was originally kind of cobbled together in the 1980s from a series of um, uh, a series of newsletters. Um, it's an extremely militant text. It's called Siege. It was authored by an American neo-Nazi called James Mason. Um, it's central to the Siege subculture. Obviously, that's kind of where it got its name from. It's kind of almost a little bit like the Bible, even though it's it's kind of getting a bit passe now. It's been around for, for quite some time indeed. Um, and it's, it's kind of gained a great deal of notori uh, notoriousness. Um, it has become notorious. There we go. Um, certainly sort of the central text in this kind of accelerationism uh, milieu that's out there at the moment. Um, and people tend to kind of read it with, a, with an eye to that and sort of interpret it as being a very, very violent text. And what's interesting is if you do spend some time kind of doing a close reading, you start to realise that the, you know, violence is not the only solution proposed by Siege. Um, there are two distinct concepts within the book. One is this idea of total attack. The idea that you go out swinging, that you take down as many agents of the system as you possibly can, um, and that it basically celebrates violence, it celebrates violent cases. Um, you see this kind of play out in, in kind of material linked to siege, um, even recently kind of celebrating serial killers and people like um, Charles Manson and so on. Probably less talked about is this concept of total dropout, which is also in there, it's kind of mentioned, you know, more or less in the same entries. Uh, with the same amount of vigor. And that is the idea that, you know, you can escape the system. Um, you don't need to kind of attack it. You don't need to die in the attempt. It acknowledges that you probably would die in the attempt. And the idea is that, no, you can live apart. 
Uh, you can sever your connections. You can not pay your taxes. You can move out to your compound in the middle of the woods. Let's not forget this is an American book after all. And that you can kind of sever your connection between yourself and the system. And this was playing out even as recently as, as kind of last year. Uh, the website American Futurist, which went down a couple of days ago, which is kind of informally linked to James Mason, included an article looking at this idea of kind of, you know, when is it right to use violence? And it, it's surprising how much that kind of non-violence idea or the idea of only doing violence where it can be very effective, you know, where it's the perfect opportunity or where you have no other choice is kind of embedded. Wasting our lives, killing individuals who are useless in the grand scheme of things is exactly that. Wasting your life and throwing it in the garbage. And so it's, you can interpret this as a kind of ideological constraint or a subcultural norm against the use of violence. And what it does is it, it and I'm, I'm quite interested to hear um, sort of Joel talk about this, this concept of face um, earlier on, but it, it provides people a way to say face. It's a way to participate in this subculture without immediately kind of, you know, making good on all the stuff that you've read and launching a terrorist attack. And it legitimates this idea of nonviolent participation. So that's the first example. Um, that's quite distant now. But the second example and the final thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to kind of wrap this up now, is this concept uh, is a, a very recent text that we call Militant Accelerationism. This was published online just a few months ago. Um, it was published in multiple languages um, nearly simultaneously. And it is a fascinating read. Um, it's almost entirely post ideological. So there's very little actual ideology and it's taken up almost entirely with vi um, accounts of mobilization. So there's a lot of kind of inspirational posters. There's a lot of kind of fiction. There's an extended fictional account of a right wing terrorist attack that somebody's imagined. Um, it's quite heady stuff. It's quite graphic in places. It's, it's very violent. Um, it's 136 pages long um, and it's basically a minor work of art, to be honest with you. I mean, every page is designed like its own specific kind of poster. Uh, it's a real labor of love. There's a massive amount of time and effort gone into kind of designing all the content creating these large fictional excerpts and translating it into multiple languages, as well as distributing this thing kind of um, over Telegram in, in quite a quite a specific, specific way. So on the one hand, you can look at this as a, a kind of form of constraint, right? On a very basic level, it's an opportunity constraint. People spending all their time designing textbooks about how to engage in militant insurrection are not generally out there engaging in militant insurrection at the same time. So that's kind of on a very basic level. But in terms of the, the kind of the strengths based framework that Sir was talking about and this idea of kind of getting or kind of these secondary goods that allow you to achieve things that are denied to you through mainstream society, these roles that can help kind of fulfill you and engage you in a subculture, just kind of looking at militant accelerationism is also as a masterclass in the kind of things that you, you can do in the extreme right subculture, which are not violent, which take up a lot of time, which may provide recognition, status and satisfaction, and yet fall short of kind of, you know, terrorist attacks, basically. And so there's an awful lot of work around design, around writing, this kind of whole process of cultural production, planning in terms of kind of operational knowledge. There's an awful lot of kind of material in this book, which, you know, some of it is probably better than others, but, but basically represents people trying to pass on lessons that they have learned, knowledge that they have to other people within the subculture. This idea of kind of being a, a centerpiece and a teacher um, it, it kind of really comes out of every page. And then there's this kind of ideological work as well. The idea of being someone who is kind of steering the ideological course of the space. And this, you know, for all its lack of ideology, represents quite a big departure from material that we've seen before. And it, it really is somebody kind of really trying to put their stamp on the scene and the stamp on, their sub on the subculture as well. And you can also kind of think a little bit about kind of some of those those primary goods that it helps people, you know, obtain um, the idea of being transgressive. This is a very transgressive thing. It's a way of kind of maintaining your own distinctiveness, a way of standing out from the crowd, a way of kind of in kind of the time on a tradition of most subcultures, actually defining who we are and more importantly, who we're against, who we um, who we are not. And then lastly, you know, the opportunity for kind of creative expression as well. So those are the two kind of really quite grubby practical examples. Um, we're hoping to kind of develop some more as we uh, work through um, this kind of case study that we're doing on the siege culture thing. Hopefully there's a lot more to come. Hopefully there's a lot more data to come as well and we can really start sort of integrating some of the the lowly grubby stuff that I'm doing with, with some of the kind of the higher minded sort of theoretical stuff that Sarah is taking care of. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, you say grubby like it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm not sure I, I agree as a theoretically deeply unsophisticated historian, but my thanks both to you and Sarah for a, another excellent crystal clear presentation. So thank you to all three presenter groups. Um, my sort of